Hello, my lovelies, and welcome back to another chapter of You Don't Have to Be Evil to Work Here, But It Helps, J.W. Wells and Co. Book 4 by Tom Holt, and read by me. I would like to give some special thank yous today because you're all so wonderful and you make the effort to leave comments and you come back every time and you listen and I'm really, really grateful to you. So I'm going to do a little shout out (laughs) and that's for Bear and Jeannie and John, Rose Brody 6618, Flat Cap Gaiman, Lysandra Bouquet, Tyrese Joyner and Tony Ollier. Sorry if I've missed anybody or mispronounced anybody, but I just wanted to say thank you. I do appreciate you very, very much, and you do make all of this worthwhile. If you want to share, awesome. If you like to subscribe, that's even better. Um, if you want to ring that little ding ding notifications bell, that's fantastic. But if you leave me a like, oh, that makes me smile. <laughs> so, here we go. <laughs> Chapter 16 Benny Shumway lived in a small house. Two down, two even further down, a quarter of a mile under Fulham Broadway. He'd moved there when his fifth marriage self-destructed in a blaze of emotional fireworks. He'd needed somewhere to move out to in a hurry, and it so happened that a distant cousin of his had the place on his hands and was looking for a short-term tenant. Ten years later, Benny was still there, having bought the freehold from his cousin. It suited him. He liked traditional dwarf-built houses, laboriously chipped out of the living rock with hand tools, and it was conveniently situated, small enough to be no bother to maintain, and separated from its nearest neighbour by five million tonnes of solid sandstone. He only went there to eat, sleep, and iron shirts, so its bare functionality suited him perfectly. A bachelor pad, a pied sous terre, just the ticket except, of course, on Dustbin Day. There were some dwarves, avant-garde young tearaways with no respect for tradition, who'd installed lifts to take them to and from the surface. But Benny wasn't one of them. His link with the open air was a spiral stone staircase, as tightly coiled as a spring, each step worn glassy smooth and, of course, no lights and no handrail. It deterred unwanted visitors, for one thing. It looked right. It was good exercise, and you weren't at the mercy of electricity. But the fact that he had to be met squarely and head on, it was a real bummer hauling the dustbin bags up at once a week. Benny paused halfway up and caught his breath. He knew perfectly well what the black sack over his shoulder contained. Styrofoam pizza trays, cardboard toilet roll tubes, empty beer cans... A few discarded plastic carriers. Nothing heavy. He sighed and shifted the sack across to his other shoulder. Maybe just a small lift, exclusively for dustbin days. Nobody would ever know. Nobody but me, he thought bitterly, and continued to climb. To take his mind off his ache and neck, Benny considered the previous day's events. There had been a lot of them. The door being opened for one... Somebody must have opened it. Somebody on this side of the line. Motive? That set him thinking about the thin-faced girl and what precisely she'd seen earlier in the corridor. Apparently. At the top of the stairs, he opened the door, heaved the bag out onto the pavement and began the slow descent. The final act of yesterday's comedy of bewilderments, he remembered, had been his frantic, futile high-speed tour of the building in search of the two dead people that the thin-faced girl had claimed to have seen. He'd wasted most of the afternoon on it, and eventually he'd ended up in the closed file store, a place he'd never liked much. No dead people in there, and he'd finally come to the conclusion that thin-face had either been hallucinating, or else she told him a deliberate porky just to be mischievous. As he'd been about to leave, he noticed that someone had left the card index drawer open and had been rummaging about it like a terrier among the letters F and H that had in turn prompted him to waste another hour doing some research of his own, the results of which would be mildly interesting. In fact, it was probably a clue, possibly even the answer. But that wasn't really any help if he couldn't understand it. 
back down the stairs to finish his lukewarm tea, put on his tie and his overcoat, then back up the stairs again to the bus stop. All the way from Fulham to the city, Benny worried away at the problem, or at least the parts of it he could get at. It was a bit like doing one of those huge, annoying jigsaws, where the top half of the picture is nothing but uniform blue sky. He'd found two identical sky blue corners, but that, he was forced to concede, was about as far as he'd managed to get. It was infuriating and humiliating, and he devoutly wished that he'd never got involved in the first place. On the other hand, all the evidence seemed to suggest that Connie's job was on the line, so quietly forgetting about it wasn't an option. Thanks to roadworks and other examples of divine spite, Benny arrived on the office doorstep at seven minutes past nine. He hated being late, but at least there didn't seem to be anyone on reception to notice. He barged through the front office and sprinted up the stairs to his office. He'd read once that the wicked multinational capitalist thugs that were despoiling the Amazon rainforest at a rate of 25 acres a minute, bad, obviously, but not his immediate concern. He'd wondered, however, what on earth they actually did with all those trees, and now it seemed he had the answer. They mashed them into wood pulp, rolled them out into paper, printed stupid annoying forms on them and piled them up on his desk the moment his back was turned. Benny sighed, sat down behind his desk and realised that, thanks to the magnitude of the pile, he could no longer see the door he'd just come in through. (laughs) Wonderful. On top of the pile was a memo from Dennis Tanner, handwritten rather than typed, which was probably significant, only Benny couldn't be bothered to work out why. The auditors, it seemed, were still on the premises. This time, they'd called for 17 closed files, a printout of dollar-yen exchange rates for 1972 to 2004 inclusive, the Great London Fawn Directory, a quart of tequila and a compass. Benny read it through twice, shrugged, and put it somewhere where he'd be sure to forget about it. All dwarves are occasionally plagued by self-doubt, and Benny was no exception. One thing he never doubted, however, was his own competence as the firm's cashier. Other people might sometimes drown in the paper ocean. He had the knack of skipping light-footed across its meniscus like a crane fly. For once, however, he found the requisitions, pink paying in and paying out chits, yellow designated deposit chits, blue petty cash chits, green client account chits, reconciliation sheets, telegraphic transfer authorizations, and orange expense claim dockets hard work. He was having trouble with the numbers. Balances didn't. Twice. He even needed to use a calculator, something he felt sure wasn't quite right. It was almost as though the immutable laws of mathematics had been sat on by someone heavy and bent out of shape. Impossible, of course, because mathematics was simply a reflection of the supreme order of things, which, by definition, unless... Benny swore under his breath and turned in his swivel chair to look at the connecting door, the one that had been open yesterday when it shouldn't have been. That was something else that couldn't happen, but had... Two impossibilities. He thought about that and rang through the column of figures he'd just been adding up. He added them up again, then double-checked with the calculator, which agreed with him. 67,219. But that could not be the right answer because it had to come out the same as the total of the opposite column in the ledger. That's the whole point of the double-entry system around which the whole universe revolves. And he treble-checked that and it refused to be anything other than 67,217. I'm not wrong, Benny told himself. Therefore, the universe must be. Indeed. He leaned back in his chair and rested his chin on the tips of his steepled fingers, like an elegant saint praying in an illuminated manuscript. The universe is on the fritz. There are tiny specks of shit in the air filter of space-time, and the gaskets of eternity are leaking entropy all over the place. Fair enough. He'd been warned. He'd been given fair notice that a serious case of time cross true love had been unresolved for a dangerously long time, in which case, something's not coming out right would pretty soon be the least of his problems. Pretty soon, gravity would start cutting out, light would be losing races with the second-class male, and the only watch he'd be able to rely on for the right time would be a genuine darling. 
unless, of course, someone, a genuine hero, for example, got up off his bum and did something about it. Sod it, Benny thought. There goes my lunch, eh? Someone knocked, and his door opened. Instinctively, he tensed. But it was only Connie Schwartz-Alberish. He started to greet her, but she cut him off in mid-syllable. Benny, she said, found her at last. Where the hell have you been? He knew her well enough to realise that her question hadn't been designed to be answered. Now what? he said. Connie sat down and promptly vanished behind the mountain of paperwork. Benny sighed and brushed the whole lot of the desk onto the floor, where a stray filing charm fortuitously snapped it up and sorted it into neat piles. It's got worse, she said. No need to ask what it was. Define worse. So Connie told him about Cassie's visit from the dead time-crossed lovers, the dosing of the tea with JWW filter, Cassie and Colin murmuring sweet nothings at each other. When she'd finished, Benny frowned at her and said, So it was you then? Me? Me what? Set off the fire alarm. Maybe nobody told you, Con, but dwarves of sensitive hearing. Comes from having evolved in dark places, I guess. Honestly, I nearly swallowed my tongue. Connie asked him to do something with the fire alarm that was imaginative but impossible outside a zero-gravity environment. Don't you get it, she went on. Someone dosed that poor girl and that young clown Hollingshead with the love filter, which means... Which means, Benny interrupted, that they reckoned that getting those two to fall in love would solve the anomaly and put the fabric of space-time back together again, but it didn't work. In fact, if anything, it's made it worse. Connie looked up sharply. What makes you say that? Benny grinned. Ah, he said. Here, take a look at this, or rather... He scrabbled at the remaining papers on his desk, then jumped up and gnawed through the piles on the floor. Here you go, he said. Look at that and tell me what you make of it. Connie stared at the piece of paper he'd given her. It's just a load of numbers, she said. Benny, you know I'm no good at sums. Liar. All right, he relented. I'll give you a clue. It's a balance sheet. The numbers on the left are supposed to add up to the same as the numbers on the right, but they don't. Oh. Right, Connie said warily. So? So what does that tell you? Connie frowned. Some cheapskates been outsourcing their bookkeeping to the Andaman Islands. I, Benny said gravely, compiled that balance sheet. Therefore I know for a stone-cold, dead, absolute, unalterable certainty that the numbers should add up. They don't. Therefore... He went on before Connie could say anything. It inevitably follows that the laws of mathematics aren't working properly. The tip of Connie's nose twitched. The anomaly, she said. Exactly. And, Benny went on, I think I've got an idea why. That contract you were telling me about. The Hollingshead boy. That's right. When he dies, his soul goes to hell, right? Connie nodded. Which is a bit unfair, she added. I mean, yes, he's neither use nor ornament, but... And if your soul goes to hell, you can't reincarnate. Sure, Connie agreed. But so what? Doesn't have to. If the anomaly can be put right. True love till death is what's needed. After death, they can drag him down to the brimstone pit and set him to lighting Bill Clinton's cigars for all eternity, and it won't make a bit of difference. Possibly, Benny replied frowning, but I've got a theory about that. His frown deepened. Tell you later, he said. First things first, we'd better have a word with young Cassie, don't you think? Connie shrugged. If you think it's important, she said. It's not like I've got anything better to do, apart from finishing off some piece of shit stuff for Kaz Suslovich. Benny stood up. It's important, he said. They pay me to keep the book straight, and I can't do that if the laws of mathematics are up a tree. Let's go and find Cassie. They found her in her office. She was sitting in her chair with a typescript in front of her. The Hollingshead contract with big teardrop shaped splodges all over it. Oh, for crying out loud, Connie said. No pun intended, (laughs) as she noticed the contract. Have you been sitting there moping all morning? Yes, Cassie said. And I know, 
she added, with a faint trace of her old self. It's pathetic and stupid, and also it's not me, but... Quite, Connie said. Look, I have brought Benny up to speed, and he seems to think... Listen, will you? Cassie snapped. Yesterday, when we were talking, I quarrelled with Colin and he went running off. And then it was going home time, so I tried phoning him at home and he wasn't there. Benny shrugged. So? So, I phoned again, all evening, and then first thing this morning, I kept getting his mother, Cassie added, with a faint shudder. And she kept asking who I was. It was really embarrassing. Anyway, the point is, he didn't go home last night and they don't know where he is. The representative from the very bad people's been ringing too, apparently, which is very bad, because if Colin misses so many days at work without a doctor's note or a good excuse, they can forfeit the contract. I'm worried about him, Connie. After you left him yesterday, did he say where he was going? Connie scowled. Sort of, she said. I told him to go and find you. Two and a half seconds of dead silence. I see, Cassie said quietly. You sent an outsider to go searching the building on his own just before locking up time, at which point the goblins are unleashed and they're out to play. For a further second and a quarter, Connie was uncharacteristically silent. I'm sure nothing's happened to him, Cassie, she said. I mean, the goblins can be a bit rough and tumble sometimes, but they don't actually eat people, she hesitated. Uh, Not recently, she added. It must be, um, what, seven years since the last... Five, Benny muttered. And anyway, Connie struggled on, if that had happened, there'd have been bones and stuff. We'd have heard about it by now. You know what gossip's like in this place? Benny, she added savagely, you really are a complete bastard scaring the poor girl like that he's dead cassie said mournfully he came looking for me because i'd been horrible to him and he got lost and they locked the doors and the goblins got him and it's all my fault and i'll never forgive myself he can't be dead benny said suddenly think about it if the very bad people have been ringing his ass asking where the hells he's got to he must still be alive If he was dead, there'd be the people most likely to know about it, after all. Cassie looked at him in mid-sniffle. True, she said. Thank God, but... Tell you what, Benny said firmly. Why don't you ring again now? Here's house in the factory and see if he's still missing. Bet you he's turned up by now. Probably what happened was, after you'd run off blubbering, don't pull faces at me, Connie. You'll stick like... Colin felt really rotten about it, went down the pub, drowned his sorrows and spent the night sleeping it off in a skip somewhere. It's what I'd do. I've done many times, he added with a faint nostalgic smile. Go on, or better still, he added. Connie can ring instead. She's marginally more coherent than you are right now. Where's the number? So Connie rang, and nor. Colin hadn't come home, which was most unlike him, and nor. Rosie Tanner at the factory said. Hadn't seen hide nor hair of him all morning and that Oscar's really getting steamed up about it. And normally, Oscar wasn't her type at all, but there was something about him when he was angry that reminded her a bit of Hugh Grant or maybe Paul Newman. Fine, Benny said, as Connie replaced the receiver. So he's not at home. He's not at the factory. And he's not dead. Swear the hell is he? <sighs> Sorry, Colin said. There is no need for apology, replied the elderly Chinese gentleman, who just materialised out of absolutely nothing at all, with that special kind of automated politeness that only comes through long, bitter years of dealing with the public. You do not know me, I... He paused, and a trivial asymmetry at the end of his mouth could just about be mistaken for a smile. I have been aware of you for a while. You... He added carefully, in various versions. In fact, I knew you long before you were born, which is in itself ironic. He frowned, as if acknowledging a rebuke. Excuse me, he said. My name is Dao Shanchen. I am the chief cashier and acting deputy assistant manager of the Bank of the Dead. Bank of the... 
exactly what it sounds like. Mr. Dow confirmed, like so many of the world's great institutions, a Chinese invention set up to make it possible for the living to send money across the line to pay for the maintenance of their deceased ancestors in the afterlife. Of course, we have moved on since then, expanded our operations to the point. This time Mr. Dow's smile was almost pronounced to the point where we're even bigger than Tesco. For the time being, anyway, although strictly speaking, time has no meaning here. So you're saying, Collins said, very deliberately, that this is sort of the afterlife. Mr. Dow nodded elegantly. But I thought, Collins' eyes opened wide. How did I get here then? A moment ago I was in a building in the city of London and... uh, Ah, Mr. Dow beamed and nodded. Seventies and Mary Axe, J.W. Wells and Co. That's right, Collins said. I was looking for... for someone. He went on quickly, and I sort of wandered into one of the offices, and there was another door inside the room, so I opened it and then I was here. He paused. That was a rather bland way of putting it. What actually happened was it opened the door and immediately tumbled through out of the light into what could only be described as a total absence of anything at all. No light, no floor, no walls, no air. But he could still breathe. No sound. Nothing he could feel with his feet or hands. Nothing. And then, just as he filled his lungs with lack of air for a really big scream, Mr. Dow had popped up. Quite so, Mr. Dow said. And here you are. The afterlife. Yes. So I'm dead? At the very least, Colin had anticipated feeling fear, also despair, maybe a little anger. Instead, just a thick skin of bewilderment overlying a total deficiency of emotion. But I thought the afterlife was heaven and hell, he said. Well, hell at any rate. I'm not fussed about heaven one way or the other. Ah. Mr. Dow moved his head in a small gesture of uncertain meaning. Many cultures believe in a very bad place and a very good place. In order to meet their requirements, the bank has various subsidiary franchises in, let us say, the hospitality and entertainment sector. Those who seek hell will find it here, and just because it has been carefully designed to accord exactly with their expectations, doesn't mean it isn't entirely real. Colin nodded. A very bad place, he said. Quite so. Right, and the very good place? Mr. Dow sighed. You just left it. Oh, Colin thought about that for a moment. So, I'm really dead. Mr. Dow chuckled. Of course not, Mr. Hollingshead. You would know it if you were. Instead, you accidentally strayed through the connecting door installed in the cashier's office at J.W. Wells and Co. You are still completely, absolutely and perfectly alive. How? Oh. Colin felt his fears blossom into a relieved grin. So it's all right then. I can just turn round and go back the way I came. Alas, said Mr. Dow, and quite possibly the compassion in his voice was entirely genuine. Unfortunately, there are quite strict regulations and protocols about the use of transinia connecting doors. Access is restricted to customers of the bank, their employees and agents. You are not, I believe, employed by J.W. Wells. Er, uh, no. Unfortunate. You are, of course, a client of theirs, but the connection is rather too tenuous to be construed as a form of agency. Consequently, the door is not available for your use. You will have noticed, he added sadly, that it has disappeared. You will not be able to find it again. This is not, he added, a matter over which I have any control. It will not allow itself to be found. But that's... Colin realised he was shouting and lowered his voice. I can't stay here, he said. I'm alive. You just said so yourself. Indeed. Mr. Down nodded. And you will remain alive for the rest of your natural span, which, 
he added, in the absence of food and water and air, will not be unduly long. It would then be my privilege to escort you to our associated facility, where, of course, you are expected, under the terms of the contract you signed with the franchisee. Instinctively, Colin breathed in. It felt normal. A certain amount of air came through with you, Mr. Dell explained. Enough for perhaps fifteen minutes. If you wish, we could play chess or backgammon. Fifteen? Or perhaps you have unresolved issues about your past life which you would like to explore. If so, I will do my best to assist you. Suddenly... It was as though someone had flicked a switch and turned the power on. No, fuck it, Colin said angrily. That's not fair. All I did was go through a door to look for. He hesitated and breathed out through his nose. The point is, I didn't do anything wrong. I just opened a door and walked through it. That doesn't carry the death penalty, does it? I mean, not even Dave Blunkett ever went that far. Mr Dow shrugged slightly. In these matters, he said, context is everything. As far as the opening and use of doors is concerned, for example, it makes a considerable difference. Opening and walking through a door in your own home is generally quite safe. It would be different, however, if you were aboard a helicopter or, he added, in the cashier's office at 70 St Mary Axe. Fairness is also a relative concept. We can explore that, if you like. But I should point out that it's rather a complex issue to cover in. He paused and put the calculations under his breath. Twelve minutes and eighteen seconds. At various times in his life, Colin had believed he'd felt afraid. For example, once when he'd overtaken on a blind corner and found a lorry coming straight at him. And again when he'd seen Oscar for the first time. Now he realised that what he felt on those occasions... It's just a free sample, a trailer for the real thing. It was as though someone was winding his guts around a stick while crushing his chest with a hydraulic press. You mean it, he said. I'm going to die. Mr Dow nodded gravely. All living things die, he said, in time. And time has no meaning here. When something is too small to be measured... It might as well be treated as though it doesn't exist. In the context of infinity, human life is that small. Had you not come through the door, you might have survived, let's say, another seventy years. Seventy years is nothing. It takes that long to grow two millimetres of a stalactite. Even if you were to spend that time travelling at ten times the speed of light, you'd still be a very long way from reaching Andromeda. Consider your loss, Mr Hollingshead. It is trivial, like dropping a penny through a hole in your pocket. Hardly worth stooping to pick it up. Besides, he went on, unlike most of your fellow humans who arrive here, you have a future. Not, he conceded, an entirely attractive one but the majority of our residents would consider it preferable to the alternative, which is nothing at all. Although, he added, there is a basket-weaving class and intermediate conversational Spanish. Colin was backing away, but it was like going the wrong way on an escalator. Come on, he said, there must be something. No, Mr Dowell set his mouth firmly. Unfortunately, he added, Concessions are available only in the most exceptional circumstances, such as star-crossed true love. And of course, since you have just now resolved the anomaly in which your previous incarnations were involved, that particular concession most certainly does not apply in your case. Accordingly. And then, Mr Dow hesitated. It was as if a message had come through on headphones, except that he wasn't wearing any. He froze stood completely motionless for a moment or so, and then smiled. Your door, he said, and immediately a door swung open to Colin's left. Light streamed through it, bright and hot as a phaser beam. We apologise for any inconvenience. Have a nice day. 
Colin took a step toward the door, then hesitated. But surely, he said, Mr Hollingshead, Mr Dow said firmly, the difference between luck and a Land Rover is that you don't have to push it to make it work. Quite the opposite, in fact. Goodbye. It was a pleasure meeting you, and of course, this is merely our feeder day. What? Collins said. Then, oh, right. Already the door was starting to drift shut. Colin lunged at it, collided with it, and fell through it into blinding, burning light. When he opened his eyes again, he was lying on the floor of the office he'd wandered into. Next to him was a door. It was padlocked, bolted, chin and barred, and in case there was still any room for doubt, there was a little notice on it saying, No entry. <laughs> Fine, Colin said to himself. No problem. He was alive. There had been times over the years when he'd wondered whether being alive was everything it had been cracked up to be. There were a lot of things wrong with life. Unpleasant people. Domineering parents. Boring, pointless jobs. Maths homework. Ravioli. Girls who burst out laughing when he asked them out on dates. His stuff in general. And at various low ebbs in his career, he had wondered whether life was a tooth better removed than endlessly drilled into and root-filled. To be, he asked himself, or not to be. Now at least he had an answer to that old chestnut. <laughs> to be. Every time. No contest. And bugger not to be for a game of soldiers. <laughs> Colin lifted his head a little and gave the door a long, hard look. He didn't ever want to go back in there again. You, someone said, and a hand attached itself to his collar and hauled him to his feet. He squirmed, then a hand let go. He staggered. There you are. We've been looking everywhere for you. It took him a moment to place the short, bearded, bespectacled man who'd just let go of him. A Monopoly board and vague memories of tea shops and pins and needles. Panishan way, the man said. We met in Funkhausen's loop. This is my office. What are you doing in it? Colin backed away, felt something obstruct him, looked over his shoulder and saw a desk. I, I, I'm sorry, he said. Only I was looking for Cassie Clay. Yes, and then I went through that door there. Oh. The short man frowned thoughtfully. You did, did you? Yes, and now you're back again. Yes, I met a Chinese bloke. The short man's eyebrows shot up. Mr Dow. That's right. You know him? Oh, yes. And he let you go. Colin winced. I don't think he wanted to. Not at first, he said. But then he changed his mind. He changed his mind. Yes, in fact, he pretty well chucked me out. Fine. The short man frowned, as though trying to crush a beetle to death with his eyebrows. Sit down. You'd better give Connie a ring. Let her know you've turned up at last. You do realise you've been here all night. No, I haven't, Colin objected. I was only in there a few... In his mind, he heard Mr Dowell's voice. Time has no meaning here. Oh, he said. The short man grinned. Count yourself lucky, he said. You could have been in there for 30 years and it still felt like five minutes or the other way round. Of course. So, that was all there was to it then. He changed his mind and let you go. Colin nodded. Bloody good job too. Look, was that place really? Yes. Now, sit still and be quiet while I phone Connie. The short man picked up the phone and talked to it for a bit, then put it back. She's coming over, he said. Wants a word with you. Me too for that matter. I don't know if you realise, but you're causing a lot of problems for a lot of people. Am I? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to. The short man shrugged. I guess being you is a bit like being a landmine. You didn't ask yourself to be left lying around for people to walk all over. And when it all starts going wrong, you're the first one who gets blown up. You have my sympathy, but that doesn't mean you're not a bloody nuisance. In case you're wondering, I asked Connie to tell young Cassie that you'd been found, but not that you're here. Might complicate matters, and we've got things we need to talk about. The short man sighed and sat down on the other side of the desk. Right, he said, resting his elbows and steepling his fingers. How much do you already know about this mess? 
Telling his complex and unfortunate life story to a complete stranger stuck Colin as a dubious course of action. On the other hand, the short man seemed to know more about it than he did, and besides, he'd just come back from the dead. If there was any chance that this strange person with the beard and the glasses could actually explain any of it, he was prepared to take the risk. Well, Colin said, you were there, weren't you, when uh, he stopped. The Monopoly incident. It occurred to him that, up till now, he'd been assuming it had all been a dream, like the Bobby Ewing arc in Dallas. But the short man knew all about it, so obviously it hadn't been. Von Kersen's loop, yes. So you know about the time cost lovers thing. Or about the contract with the bad people. You know that it's you that's for the eye jump, not your dad. Colin nodded. I had sort of gathered, he said. And you know that yesterday someone spiked your tea with love potion to make you fall in love with young Cassie. That too, Colin said, with a faint, humourless grin. The short man sighed. Then you're pretty much up to speed, he said. And now you've been through that door there, you've met Jackie Dow and he let you go. You know, that's rather interesting. In fact, oh bloody hell, what is it now? The phone on the desk was burbling. The short man picked it up. Listened, then started up the beetle squashing routine again. No, he said. She's not here, but don't bother ringing round any more. I'll come and deal with him. Yes, fine, bye. He put the phone down and leaned back in his chair. You wouldn't happen to know our new receptionist, would you? He said. Colin nodded. She's my one true love, he said. Or at least, he added with a scowl, she was, until someone put that stuff in my tea. I see. The short man was staring into space. Then he seemed to snap out of it. Well, he said, you may be interested to hear. Your old man's just turned up at the front office and he wants to see young Cassie. I don't think that'd be a good idea right now. And I feel like I'll work with him myself. You want to see him? Eh, uh, no. Didn't think you would, somehow. All right, you push off. Go sit in one of the empty offices or something. I'll get Connie to come and find you when the coast is clear. I'm going down to have a chat with your dad. Benny stood up, then stopped. I had a look at the closed file index, he said. Turns out that your dad's company has been a client of ours for 180 odd years. You wouldn't happen to know off and exactly what it is that we've been doing for you all that time, would you? Not a clue. Unlike the short man, Colin didn't have the eyebrows for beetle extermination but he could probably have managed a small earwig. The first I heard about this firm was when Dad was negotiating the contract and he made it sound like he'd only just found out about you. (laughs) Well, the short man said, it may pain you to learn this, but your dad's a bit of a fibber. I hope it won't scar you for life, me telling you that. Colin smiled thinly. I think it's rather nice to have a life to be scarred for. Actually, do you think there's any chance I might be allowed to keep it? The short man breathed in deeply. He had the air of someone who'd just agreed to take on yet another tiresome chore he could well do without. Organising the Christmas party, being secretary of the Esperanto Club, looking after someone's dog while they're abroad for a fortnight. He gave the impression that he didn't exactly welcome that sort of thing, but he was used to it. No promises, he said but I'll see what I can do. Well, well, well. It just doesn't get any better for Colin, does it? But I'm glad Mr. Dow, like, threw him a born and let him out. But why? Who do you think communicated with Mr. Dow subliminally or liminally? Who knows? Anywho, I shall be back in a couple of days with another chapter. If you could bing, bing that notifications bell and hit the like button or share or subscribe, any of that would be absolutely fantastic. I do really, really appreciate you and any, any comments or likes or anything like that just lets me know it's worth to keep going. And I love making these chapters for you. I love making these audiobooks for you. And I think it's so wonderful we've got this nice group of people that will come together around Tom Holt because he's a freaking legend. Anyway, I'll stop burbly wobbling myself um, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Stay safe, take it easy and thanks for listening, Petal. I'll be back soon.